Hello, my name is Valerie Hillings and I'm director of the North Carolina Museum of Art and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this artist talk with Scott Avitt tonight. We're really excited. As, as you may know, this is Scott's first solo museum exhibition, so it is our great pleasure to be the venue for sharing the great talent that he developed coming out of studying at ECU and um, continuing on as, of course, he developed his amazing music career. So we are really excited to celebrate this truly exceptional North Carolina artist um, tonight and throughout the run of the show. So um, I, I would like very much to thank our, our sponsors for the show. Uh, we have up front Larry and Debbie Robbins. Thank you very much. And um, also Nancy and Ron McFarlane, Soko Gallery, Chandra Johnson's here this evening. Alan Thomas Jr. and the Umstead uh, Resort and Spa. So we're really grateful to all who made this possible. <laughs> As I like to say, you're not here to see me. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Scott Avid and our chief curator, Linda Darty. Good evening. So Scott and I have done this before. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how it'll work. I will ask him questions and he will talk about whatever he wants to regardless of my question. <laughs> so it will be highly entertaining. And we will do this for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions to all of you. So to get started, um, I would say everybody here knows you as a musician and everybody all over the place knows you as a musician. You just had your 17th album come out. You play in arenas all over the place. And most people don't know that in addition to being an incredibly talented musician, you are a highly accomplished visual artist as well, a printmaker and a painter. And you have been ever since you graduated from Eastern Carolina University in Greenville in 2000 with a BFA in studio art. Now, the question is, were you talked into going into the band with your brother in 2000 when you founded it instead of having an art career? Well, um, in 2000, when I left ECU, I went back to uh, the Charlotte area, to Concord, North Carolina, and opened a, a gallery you know, about a year and a half after that, kind of in that, in that, uh, that, that uh, in between time after graduation. Um, during that, I was applying to uh, University of Florida in Gainesville um, to go to graduate school there for, uh, for f to focus on figurative painting. And uh, I was told by a professor that I had Leland Wallen uh, was his name to go to Florida and then move to New York and and paint. And uh, that my music was good, but <laughs> that I was born to paint and I needed to move to New York and. To, to live a uh, minimum there, uh, a year, um, but three years would really give me a good idea for of what, what I was made of in New York. Um, I, uh, I deferred my acceptance to uh, University of Florida, then uh, tried to defer again, and as the, the gallery that I was uh, just talking about, as it sort of petered out uh, and touring started to take over my life, uh, and I attempted to defer graduate school one more time, the, uh, the, uh, the university there said, look, it sounds like you're gonna be a musician. You're, <laughs> you're busy. Why don't you call us if you ever decide to go to graduate school and we'll, we'll talk. Uh, that moment, there was also a, a, a booking at Merle Fest that we had, that I, I don't know if symbolically I hinged my decision on that and said, well, if we get into Merle Fest in 2004, then I won't follow visual art if we don't I'm gonna quit the band and give myself to, uh, to visual art only, uh, or at least primarily. And um, so we, when we got accepted to Merle Fest, uh, we went and played it. I said, okay, I'm gonna devote my, my time to touring and making music. But I had been warned of um, the dangers of, of not making art. Like, the, I guess it, there was a percentage of how many uh, art students go on to work other jobs and don't continue to make art. Um, that didn't make sense to me. I wanted to, uh, to uh, I don't know, uh, 
own up or, or uh, let's see, hold on a second. I wanted to maintain and honor the obligation that I, I had to, to create things visually. So I sort of uh, declared that I would always have a painting studio, no matter where I lived. Um, so when my wife and I got married in 2003, that was uh, after an eight month break, which is the only break I've taken since I painted in college. I started painting again uh, and have painted ever since. That, that was in 2003, kind of overlapping the time where I decided to really, to really do it for good. And I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, um, that it's almost been a secret part of your life, that mm. your life as a musician and a performer is very public and your visual art has been a more private, creative pursuit. And did you intentionally do that? And why have you kind of decided to bring it out now? No, I mean, no, I, I didn't do it intentionally. I, I did show along the way. And, um, and like I said, after, after school, I thought, well, I'll have a gallery basically so I can show my work. This has always been about me uh, all along. <laughs> It always was. I wanted to shout. I wanted to be. I want to be a famous artist, you know. And if it was a famous visual artist or a famous musician, um, it's less that I wanted to be it. It's just that I was. I was born to be it. I mean, I just knew that. <laughs> I knew that all along. That sounds so funny, but it's like it's true. It's true. I just. I knew it. I knew it from an early age, and uh, uh, I knew that I. I was talented early on. I knew. I knew how to draw. I mean, I, I knew it. And I. I don't read very well. I don't pay attention very well. I don't listen very well. And, but I did draw really well. So that was one of the things that I did well, and I knew that I wanted to, uh, well, I knew that I could show off with it. Yeah. So it's just with just like songwriting and, and getting on stage and, and acting and, uh, uh, with the band, it was something that I could do very comfortably. And, and uh, I think more naturally, though, than, than, than music. Like I'm, I'm much more naturally a visual artist and a musician. M music is something that I really have to work hard to, uh, to maintain. Uh, and it, since I do it so much, I've, I've gotten to be decent at it. Um, <laughs> I'm a better songwriter than I am a musician, uh, I hope. That's, that's what I feel, I mean, naturally. But I don't know, I forget what the question was. <laughs> Just talk about what I want to do. The question was, you know, why you've kept it more Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a secret, and yeah. now we're putting it out. Yeah, I just happened to, you know? I just happened to. I, the last time I showed in 2012, I did a pop-up style show in Charlotte in an abandoned apartment, and it was a great, uh, a great moment and a, a, quite a little success. It felt really good, but I cleaned out all the, the work that was medium size. It was all gone, and now I, I realized that I'd been working on all this work, I'd been making all this work to show it. That's really the point. I wanted to show it and talk about it, and now it's gone. Um, and it was nice to to make that money, but now it's gone. And so I thought that wasn't that wasn't quite right the way I just did that. One weekend, it's all gone, and now I'm back, and I have all these large pieces. But I want to show at some point. So I felt like I kind of took a, a step back for two steps forward. And I, at that point, I, I said to myself, I'm not going to show again until until it's big. And that's around the time that you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Shani and, and Soko Gallery were, were so kind, and the timing is, is so right to say, you know what, Scott, if, if it is right for you, we're here for you to do it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's been really about timing, very natural. And that's something with, with Rick Rubin, our producer in, in the music world, uh, he always pushed and, and uh, promised that if you make good things, if you make things true to you, then everything else is gonna fall in place. We don't ever lead with business with this is gonna be huge or this is gonna be good. It's always lead with this is gonna be true to you. And if that is, that is the case, everything else is just gonna fall right in place for good and bad. And we've also talked about the relationship between your music and your visual art and kind of where you see crossover, where it kind of parallels each other. And you know, do you feel like you approach writing a song the same way you approach painting a painting? And are there storylines and narratives that you play out in both places? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. I mean, I go to the studio and I, I can go in and say I'm gonna work on, on something visual. There's always something to work on. I mean, always. Uh, and that's probably where I'll go first. 
music or a song will nag at me and there'll be an idea. Uh, as far as subject matter, they're probably one and the same. So probably the songs are the equivalent of what the, the visuals are. They probably are the exact same uh, if I had to do, if I was put to test or tested myself to uh, make that song into a painting. Uh, you know, Father's First Spring would be uh, some sort of, of painting of, of, of my daughter and, and something going on with her. Uh, it would make sense. A lot of those songs that have to do with some of the family, that, that's pretty obvious. Um, but I, I don't know if I know. I really don't, I don't really know. Well, as an outside observer, I see a relationship yeah. between them. And I think um, we've been talking about this when we've been walking through the gallery, and it's this idea of kind of the truthfulness and the reality of what you're painting. You know, it's your personal relationship. It's your personal life that you're kind of revealing and letting people into. And I think just like with your songs, that's how people connect with you is that opening up. And in some ways, it's also they see themselves in it, too. Totally. That is true about it. That is that is a, a common denominator. Um, there's this, uh, have you all heard of Rob Bell? Has anybody heard of Rob Bell? He wrote this book called Love Wins. Uh, he commented on a show before we put out this new record. Uh, he commented on a show at the Greek in Los Angeles a couple months ago where and I've never heard this before, but I've, I've wanted to articulate it. He said, this show, he said, it was, a, it was an attack on cynicism, which is great. There's an onslaught. And he said, and it was so political. And I was like, well, okay, hold on, what? And he said, and so political because it brought so many people to one spot, and they weren't raging against anything. They were just there jamming and having a good time. And, uh, and, together, and there's no way they all agree. Um, I think that is a, um, a direct uh, reflection of trust in our personal relationships that everything about our spirituality, our politics, our, our emotion and our feeling about everything is, uh, is tied up in our little personal experiences. And that goes back to just trusting that if I exploit that and show that, I don't have to go searching for uh, inspiration or, or a, a story. It's all right there. Um, uh, I say that because I think that that has to happen a lot when I'm, I'm pulling up something very personal and thinking, who, who wants a portrait of this? Like, who would, why would anybody want to share space with this? That's a dumb way of thinking anyway. That's not the point. I really, I really have to avoid those, those thoughts anyway. Um, but I have to just trust that all those little personal relationships are, uh, they're universal. That's the point. Seen the show yet? Uh, there's one gallery that's filled with very large scale portrait paintings. These are monumental paintings. They're larger than life. I would say they're about eight or nine feet tall for the most part. Could you talk about why you paint at that scale? Yep. So it started that I just wanted to, uh, you know, I love painters like Courbet and Caravaggio, uh, obviously. Uh, I love the idea of the underdog. I, um, uh, I don't know, I just, just came up that way. Uh, it, uh, it was blue collar America is, is where I'm from and I, I connect to it and relate to it. And so uh, even in school, I was wanting to paint glorified versions of, uh, of blue collar employees and people that I understood and, and was around a lot. Uh, in this case, I was in a space that was very, very large and uh, that's what I saw. So I saw the walls lined with, with paintings that were big enough to uh, look right in that space. And I wanted to glorify uh, family members. I wanted to glorify myself. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to just make it big and larger than life and, and make it, you know, uh, praise it in a way, celebrate it in a way. Uh, at, at the time, people that weren't, weren't really known, you know, that well known. Uh, really, that's important to me. Um, as, a, as just something to help me justify what, what I was doing. I also learned uh, that, my, that my stroke is much more, is much more of this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm it's just not, not a, uh, yeah. I'm not that way with songwriting or music. Like even my management of, uh, of our business, I, uh, I have to micromanage and get detailed a lot. However, when it comes to managing songs and music and 
that's where I'm so thankful that Seth will come in because my, that's not my stroke. It's not like, oh, well, let's, let's, I, I think there's, there's an, in, well, not an infinite, but there's so many ways that things can go right. And I like whenever it just falls in there, I'm good. I'm good. I don't think there's one, there's only one way it's going to go right or going to go well, but there's a lot of ways it can go well. So with that, I'm good. And I, I move on. That, that speaks a little bit to what I was saying about my motives start to get mixed the longer I work on a piece as well. Same thing with music. The longer I spend with something, there's a, there's a shelf life where it stops being, um, there's like this golden moment and it stops being, being that. It starts, the motives just start to get mixed in a way. And so I always know when that ends and I've torn, torn down a lot of canvases, all the stretchers because of that, that I put a lot of time in and just looked at as, as uh, an exercise or practice uh, in, in painting and just leave it at that. Um, and I think in the show, there are two paintings side by side, and one you said you spent nine months on, and the other was two weeks. Yep, two of the same size, some of the nine-footers, yeah. yeah. And it's incredible, the one that was done in two weeks. I had more control of the paint and color the whole time. That two weeks was, uh, it was just, it was fast, and it was in control, and the other one felt, it was so painful to make, and it was out of control. And I repainted it over and over and over, and it felt, it was not fun to paint. It was such a pain. Um, and the motives were very clear, you know, and it, I went in with very clear motives on That's the Toy Pieta one. It was, it was meant to overwork that. Like, I'm, I went in, I wanted to, uh, to really work that, that space, um, the, the space on the canvas, so uh, the page. Uh, the other one, I'd, I sort of just took what I learned and did it fast. When we started working on this show together, I loved finding out your connections to the museum that already existed. So not only did the Avid brothers play here early on, I think it was 2007, I found out that when you were at ECU, you would come here and spend a lot of time in the galleries and not in the modern and contemporary galleries, in the old master painting galleries. Can you talk a little bit about what draws you to those paintings? Yeah. Well, I came to see the Ribera a lot. The is it? Yeah, yeah. I looked at that one a lot because, you know, he, he, he was. I mean, he was probably as good as Caravaggio, and, and his handling of flesh was uh, was important in light, chiaroscuro lighting. Um, but also, I think what my relationship really started was when I was way into this painter Odd Neardrum, and you had this Odd Neardrum painting here, and I I got in an argument with the security guard here because I was right up on it. And while I was <laughs> on it. back up. <laughs> well, they did, and I, and, but while I was on it, it was really dusty. Uh, and so <laughs> I was offended when she told me to back up, and I said, well, the painting, it, to, to, you know, at my defense, I figured, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll skew this a bit. I'm like, the painting is That's so it. dusty, why don't you Point clean the painting? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, what is this? Like, seriously? Uh, yeah, I had but, to respond. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> but I mean, this is the closest. This is the closest museum to me, you know. And so it's uh, it, at the time it was, and so uh, well, it still is. Yeah. Well, n maybe not. <laughs> but it's close. And uh, I mean, that was just study and seeing seeing those masters. Any of that, any of that, anything that was chiaroscuro lighting, that was the, that was what I was going to to look at to see how how something pops off the page um, from light to dark. That's really what it was all about. So one thing I'll let you know, the next time you come back to the museum, in the other building we, where our permanent collection galleries are, we've hung one of Scott's paintings in the old master painting galleries. It's in a room called the Kunstkammer, and it's um, the cover from your album, I In Love and You. And it's the painting that was the cover for the album, and it's hanging next to a 17th century Flemish painting that's very much in the manner and style of the artist that he's looking at at Caravaggio. So it's a really nice pairing that you'll have to come back and look at when that building's open. Yeah, it worked out perfect. And then, um, <laughs> it that was did. Just my plan. Ah. <laughs> ah. I thought it was my idea. Uh, yeah. It was your idea. <laughs> it was. It was. Um, before we open it up for questions, I'd like to kind of go back to this idea that you brought up early on where you've said things like, um, above all else, I'm an artist, I'm a musician by default, and then just kind of your approach to creativity and how that statement plays into it. Um, this idea of needing to express yourself, I guess, is yeah. what I'm getting at. 
Yeah, I think all this has been an exercise for me yesterday and today and the whole show, just having the show is, a, is an exercise in accepting um, gratitude from other people, uh, um, accepting my own greatness, and and saying, <laughs> and by no means meaning that I, that I'm special because of that. Like, it, there's there's it's such an exercise in that. And uh, I'm old enough now that I really have that in check in my mind. Um, but even that statement, like I just made, I'm not even sure what it means. And like trying to talk about all this stuff and make explanations for the work is all nonsense. I really just know very little about what any of it means a lot of it's in hindsight where I look back and go oh well, I think maybe what I was doing was this or that and it's much better for other people to, to let me know what I was doing because really it's being done to them uh, it's already done for me um, but at this point I don't think a whole lot about um, about any of that about what I am first or second that's at this moment. Now, when I'm writing and thinking about it, I'm sure I'll, I'll dissect it again. Uh, but it's, it's much, uh, much more instinctual right now. And I'm very, I'm very thankful for that. I feel like it's, it's, it's a gift and a blessing to be in that place where I can let it be instinctual. And uh, make that space and that time for that. Uh, to be able to say, it's not right today and I won't do it. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's the discipline that I really follow now. Uh, instead of trying to force it to happen. Um. When we had a conversation like this before at SoCo Gallery, at the end of it, someone said to you, well, if you were forced to choose, what would you pick, being a musician or an artist? And I think that was just not a question to ask because I think for creative people, it doesn't necessarily matter what form it takes. It's what you're trying to express. And it can be a song, it can be a painting, it can be a performance. Yeah. That the you know the method and the process is not as important as what how it gets out there. Yeah, I have like a, a lot of theories come come to me. Like this theory about this has been an exercise on ego. I just tested that on you guys, and I'm not really <laughs> sure if it really works. I'm not I'm not sure if it works. I'm not. It's not sussed out or anything like that. Um, but I have another theory that I think, and I just thought about this. That this just just started now. Words, just like silks, like screens for silk screen, just like brushes, uh, just like our fingers, uh, a piece of cardboard or whatever. The, these are all, in my mind, if I'm thinking about making work, they're all just, just a set of brushes. You know, not to be cliche, but they're just a set of brushes in in my in my work in my studio. And words are no different than that that palette there with brushes. It's just another another shape. They almost are letters, you know? They almost do make sounds. I mean, it's, it's all so blended and mushed together that I, I'm just trying to go with it and, and recognize and be aware of the, of the gift that it is to be able to even do it and for it to be an, a, a problem or not at any moment. That's what, I mean, what a blessing that is. What a privilege. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, we're going to let you all ask questions, and I think there is a mic on the side or not. Yeah. Hey. Good. How are you doing? Good. For someone who's so visual, like when we watch you on stage, you're very visual. You're moving around. We see you. We're watching you. We love it. Um, and you're talking about your broad stroke. Why the title Invisible for the show? Yes. What was the first name? What was the first title? The end of a secret. Okay. Yeah. 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 That was your. <laughs> yeah. That's where. That's where it started. That was another bad idea of mine. <laughs> because I had this whole thing like, what's at the end of a secret? And I was like, well, the truth is what's at the end of the secret. <laughs> Which is also like with the new record, Closer Than Together. I was like, hey, Closer Than Together, Seth. And I was like, oh, it's a terrible idea. So I was like, no, we got to do it. It's good. It's good. It's good. I was like, oh. Um, but when we were, we were going with the end of a secret, which might not be the truth. <laughs> the end of a secret is a lie. Uh, but I, we were talking about how it would print on the book or on a poster, and I was like, well, it would be cool if it went, if it sort of faded or was invisible. We used some, some clear ink or something like that. And uh, Bob Chase, who helped, uh, who actually is responsible for printing that book and putting it together, uh, he heard that and saw that in the, in the, whole, the whole concept. And 
He's like invisible. So he, he didn't tell me instantly. He kind of, he's like, oh, okay, I'll talk to you later. And then he kind of hung up pretty quick and then developed it. And when he presented it, it was like, oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, you know, it's, play, it's kind of glorifying something that's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be true. Just like a, a lot of songs, they don't necessarily have to be true to be, to be, um, to be true. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I'm hitting it tonight. I don't know. It's like, uh, we'll just, just keep, let's see. Yeah, we'll hit, hit something in a second. Any, mm, yes, you must, yeah. <coughs> stand, if you stand up, I think we'll hear you. <coughs> yeah. Um, so my question would be, how do you find balance between being a visual artist, musician, father, husband, family? That's a billion hours. How do you find the to do all the things that I'm going to defer to my wife. <laughs> I, think, I think she'd be able to say whether I actually do find balance, but uh, she'll be able to answer that. But uh, <laughs> she'll tell you the truth. Um, What's an example? I don't know if this if this uh, explains that, but like the other day we were doing something and Bob was telling, uh, both of us were in the same place and Bob was like, man, I am so off today and so worn out, you know, we were just like, and we were going into something that was going to be six hours long and I was like, well, then let's just be off, you know, let's just be off in this. And uh, that's a discipline of like trying not to, you know, it, that's always in, a big part of therapy, you know, like you embrace whatever it is you are, you, you let it be and... Uh, <coughs> You don't try to fight it. That's been so. That's important for me to to listen to that whenever it's saying don't go to the studio, and I have more fun when I'm when I'm listening to that and not doing constantly. And I start undoing, non-doing, and then when I do do, <laughs> it's uh, it's much more um, productive. It's it's so much more productive. It's like uh, it takes so much less time to make good things. Uh, because I'm rested, I'm having fun. There was a something about doodling. Uh, like all of this is just a bunch of doodling, really. Ultimately, it's just somebody. Somehow, I've fallen into this pattern where I'm. I take time to doodle, and I'm doodling on big pieces of canvas, you know, and doodling on notebook paper, and doodling on the the recording gear, and um, so it's really fun. So it never feels like so much at this point. It, it's not always been this way, and it could be different again for sure. But at this point. It feels like uh, it feels like the privilege that it is. It's 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 a lot of fun. I'm trying to uh, to take that. Another question. So you said that um, you knew from a young age that you were good at these things that you're good at. With having children who are young, do you see some of yourself in them with their creativity? Yeah, and to clarify. I wasn't sure I was going to be good at any of them. I just, I just knew that I was going to be famous for them, right? Um, I mean, I'm a true believer that every single one of us is a beloved son or daughter of God, period. I know that for certain. And because of that, this isn't the only bright, shining person in this room, every single yeah. one of us. It's insane. It's insane how true that is. It's so true that it's not so special, right? And that's great. That's good. That's a good thing. So that was what was, I think that's what I, I'm articulating as, like, I'm going to be great. <laughs> but whether I'm great at whatever, it never, and my, you know, our parents told us that exact thing. Dad used to say, you know, if you're a, if you're a carpenter, you're going to be a great carpenter, you know? And you can be a very popular carpenter these days, and that's great. <laughs> you know, you could be famous for that, but... Um, I just always lived like that, like someone was watching. It was God the whole time. It was right there with me and in me, you know, the whole time. And, I, you know, when I was younger, it was so much easier to access that. And now, uh, growing older, it's about opening up to access that again. Because for a little while, I've been thinking that it wasn't that, you know. And uh, I don't know. That, that's, that's what I'm getting at. I'm not, you know, like, I didn't really know that things would work out. And they work, I'm in such a, a, it's really a particular, peculiar position 
the way, the way that Seth and I and Bob and the rest of the group, the way that we have had success is so peculiar and particular to, specific to our situation. My, this, this art career is the same thing. Here we are in a museum show, and I, I mean, I've really not, not shown, I mean, I haven't shown much at all. That's, that's so bizarre to me, <laughs> but expected, because I know that, because <laughs> I know what I am, you know? I know what we are. I, well, maybe not. <laughs> this, I like this theory a lot. I'm really fond of this one. It's a good one. You know, it makes everybody happy. <laughs> Yeah, as someone who is not visual, I'm wondering what is in your mind when you're going to a blank canvas and you pick up a brush? Do you have an image that you're trying to put onto a page? And how much does what's in your mind change as you're going through the process of painting? Uh, it can change one, like 180, you know, it can change 100%. Um, and it's always different every time I approach a canvas. I've used grids before to try to get likeness. Uh, as close as I can, I have uh, I have gone to canvas with nothing, you know, no reference of anything, and just just gone at it to see what happened. Uh, I've I've designed on the computer many many times, over and over and over, uh, very specifically. Um, I don't have I don't have a, a specific way, a formula. Right now, I'm really interested in um, uh, prepping all the canvases as notebook pages, you know large notebook pages, and then, I, and then I'm painting on them. Um, there's something about the notebook page that's really intimidating to me. So I, when I approach a canvas now, it's a notebook, a giant <laughs> notebook page, you know, a nine foot notebook page. That's, uh, that's interesting. So it's making me do things that I didn't, I didn't expect. Um, but every painting really turns out different than what I thought, whatever I was thinking. I'm not sure whatever I thought it would be. Um, I'm actually a middle school science teacher, okay? so I am not, not artistic in, in every way. <laughs> but I have several students who are very artistic and they doodle a lot in class and everything. And they're not academic. How, what recommendations do you have for students to foster that and the as teacher to really appreciate the gift that they have? Is it something that I don't fully understand? rather be artistic and explore that side and I'd like to encourage that and maybe school isn't the right avenue for them. You know, how how do you as a teacher and how do you really foster that in, in children? You know, like yourself, maybe you were the same way when you were in seventh grade. I was. I was. I have no idea how to foster it. I can't I'm not a teacher. <laughs> um, I really don't, but I was that way. I could speak on that. I mean, I was a terrible student through high school. Like, uh, in fact, there's a science teacher. Mr. Coggins, are you here tonight? <laughs> he was here last night, so. All right, well, Monty Coggins was one of the teachers that actually, get, he was one of the few. He really is the one, the beacon that, uh, that kind of gave me space and ad admired what I did. And I didn't read, I didn't study. Uh, not until well into college did I read a book or do assignments outside of uh, doodling. I doodled constantly. Um, I don't. I don't know if there's really a lot of hope for <laughs> kids doing that in science class. <laughs> I mean, I think that's okay. <laughs> for sure. You all remember when Leland used to say these are uh, cl classmates of mine that uh, studied under Leland. Leland Wallen used to tell us about uh, painters that went on to be surgeons. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Ah, well, he used to say, oh, they, they, turned, they went on to medical school and because they had such, such specific uh, uh, talents with their hands that they would, they would do certain. Now, I, don't, I have no idea how that kind of thinking transfers because I was terrible in science and in math, really, really bad. Um, I don't know. I will say that I see in my children, one is, uh, is always in the now, he never thinks about what's before or after tomorrow or the day, but like never. And he's, he's not methodical at all, but he expresses himself constantly and he, he makes things in creative ways that none of us, you know, nobody else but him thinks of. Where I have a daughter that 
is so methodical that she doesn't even have to have a natural ability to, uh, for rhythm, she, cause she'll train herself and plays the piano and the violin and can train herself to do it where the other will sit there and like just belt out and you're like, good gosh, what? That's incredible. But he's like, you try to give him piano lessons and he's not gonna show up. There's no way. That was me. I, there's no rush. That was what I would think. Like for my kids, I'm thinking there's no rush. I, uh, you know, I had no clue. Uh, we didn't go on our first tour until I was 26 years old, like first official tour. I had no idea this is what my living would be. Uh, so we don't have to have to know. We still have to grow up, I think, a little earlier than we do. I recently just became a man <laughs> this year. I've been in, the, how do I know? I don't know, I just feel it. I just, I just feel it. <laughs> I'm gonna defer to my wife for this one. All right, Sarah. Specific moment. Well, yeah, she can tell you about all about that. No, 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 no. Uh, no, but like the threshold of this is totally off subject, but but maybe not the threshold of being a child into manhood, uh, like a boy into manhood. I stayed in for a long time, I guess because I could. And I think a lot of us can. It's not just me, but that's a different a different topic. I just want to make sure I get some people in the back. Uh, yeah. So when you. Uh, do your work in your studio? Do you put any music on? Do you listen to yourself? <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, let's see. I think, I, I mean, yeah, I have. I have before. Um, I, it, it's back and forth. Sometimes I can't take any music and uh, Maybe maybe we are performing something. Maybe there is a song that I've got to relearn that I used to sing that I don't know anymore. I will just loop for two hours. You know that's that happens. Uh, if it's something that's going to drive me to write, that's a bad, that's not a good combo. That's a quite a distraction when I'm really focused because painting it is so. Once you're in, once you break through in that first hour or so, then you're you're so in, and that's when like really like like out of this world moments happen. They really do. There is a runner high. I mean, it is, it is incredible. And once you get in that, you don't want to break out of it. So, um, so if I'm listening to something, it is very repetitive. I, I like the, like there's a group called Neurosis. Mm -hmm. Neurosis is like this really spacious metal. Like, I like that type of thing. That's really good for me in the studio. I can't imagine it was easy to share all these pieces in the exhibit. So I was wondering, what was the hardest piece for you to share and why? Well, the the uh, the boy eating um, that one is very much this realization of this little me that was that that's been put in check over the, the recent year. Um, in that threshold, I'm talking about there's a and there's a dying off of that that was very very um, fragile and tender and. Uh, very vulnerable for me. And I realized in hindsight, looking at the painting, it really looks a lot more like me than it did the portrait that I was making of my son. It really is. It's, it's much more me at seven years old than it is uh, him. And I realized, I, I kind of looking back on it, it, it dawned on me that this is, I just can't, I can't help but paint this little me right now. Um, but there's a, there's a, so that's the one. There's the, that's the one. I don't want to trail off. I'm just going to. Yeah, that's the one. Because that, that's a moment. Yeah, I yeah, know. I should. I should. Thinking along those same lines, the music is, 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 does come from a place of vulnerability where, where you open up yourself, your thoughts, your feelings, your fears, whatever. Um, the same thing being with the artwork. When you put a song out into the world, it's out into the world and it changes and becomes what whoever's listening to it is feeling or experiencing at the time. With your artwork, how do you let let go of that, those things that, that touch you so tenderly and, and came from that place inside of you, how do you go about sharing it to the world into the point of where you can actually sell it, let it go. Yeah, yeah. Become something else to someone else. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Uh, 
that the painting with the boy with the toy gun, you know, just that's it's one of those tender moments, very, very dear, very special to me. And uh, I don't really know. I, I think uh, <coughs> somewhere along, I mean, you used to not be able to imagine parting with any of them. Right. And now I've just kind of said, you know what? I, what am I going to do with them anyway? I'm just going to like blinders and go and they're they're available to the world period uh i bet later I'll, there'll be some that i regret you know and there are a few that i've chosen and said you know these these stay but i don't know i guess i think it speaks to presence and and really wrapping around the moment and not getting caught up with it. nostalgia is something that i indulge in a lot and really really you know i, I geek out on it and I have to put, I have to really put that at ch in check and at bay because it can, it can tear me, tear me apart. And hold you back. And hold me back. And so when I'm here now, really none of them matter. Really. They're just, they're just paint on canvas, you know. Um, I know that's not true. <laughs> they are really good representations of little moments that then I put, I labor in, in, spending time with those moments. So they are very nostalgic in that way. There's what I was going to say to you in this, this uh, uh, what's the word? What is it? What is it? Yeah, that's it. It relates to, to that as well. Um, sorry. Uh, there's, a, there's a painter in New York named Jacob Hayes who I sat for for a, a portrait show called um, Artist, well, it was Artist Painting Artist. And, it went on to be in a, the Smithsonian National Portrait Competition. And it, it, he, I sat for him the first day that I ever sat through therapy. And I was just a, a, a vulnerable wreck. And I mean, so, so just, just small and damaged. And I didn't think a lot about it. I mean, I, I went in and sat for it because it was what I was going to do. But when I saw the painting, it was so that moment. And... It's like, I gotta buy this painting of me. <laughs> it's so realistic and so incredibly and so like just so incredibly done. I mean, so incredibly realistic and, and naturalistic and so well done. Uh, I, I had to have it because it's, it now it sits in my studio. And I mean, it's so sad. Oh. It is so sad. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. I mean, I look at it, I'm like, I'll, I'm, I'm not there anymore. This is awesome. Okay. And I'm like one happy question. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> anyway, nobody's getting sad here. I'm wearing this leather jacket in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this shirt. I mean, come on. All right. So, so Scott, you, in music, there's a natural life cycle. There's an album, a tour, recording, and a new album. For your visual art, what's that timeline look like after this? What's next for us who love it? Well, it's already happening. I mean, I've already moved on from a lot of this work, and I'm, I'm um, you know, one thing leads to another with the music and with the vision, with with my painting and my printmaking. So that's kind of in real time, and that's been going on in real time since any of these pieces these pieces are part of that real time journey. So I see commonality and theme in this new group of work that I'm making now. If it's a group. Uh, like I said, going back to 2012, I was like, there is no, I'm not in a cycle here. I'm going to work until I have the work that I want to show. And when timing's right, I'll know. So I don't see any point in making a deadline. Like, that's another thing that we work really hard to, to live in a bubble of creativity that has no budgets or deadlines. So you know what? We have to protect this. Uh, so I'm just steady working. Now, I, I do, like I said, I do work much faster than I used to. And I also have learned how to delegate my resources, uh, use my resources in, in, in better ways. So as screens are being made, I'm coming off a tour, I get home and there they are. Or while I'm on tour, I've designed what I'm gonna paint, more or less, you know, at least where I'm gonna start. And then I'm right in there and it happens fast. Uh, so that's happening now. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll show uh, much sooner than, in fact, I, I will have another small show in January at Soco Gallery in Charlotte with newer work. So it's, which it will be, you know, 
I think uh, communicating with this show very well and, and working, it relates to it. There's that word, it relates to it very well. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. It means a lot. We're right, gonna stop you. now because there's a party that's about to start and I hope you all are staying with us for this evening and thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it.